And tonight we've got a, a great speaker, Alan Pascuzzi, who's well known to all of you um, as a, a mainstay of the Florentine art history scene, uh, working uh, sculptor and, and painter himself, st student of the techniques of the Renaissance and a very knowledgeable scholar. Uh, next week we have um, Jeremy Boudreau returning for the, the next in his series of Florentine neighborhoods. Uh, and next week he's taking us to the Cachonet, the, the park uh, along the east side of the city on, on the Arno. Um, and those of you being, who've heard um, Al, um, Jeremy on his uh, Florentine neighborhood visits know that that will be an entertaining um, uh, lecture next week as well. Um, so without further ado, I'm now going to hand over to uh, Alan to give his lecture. Thank you, Alan. Thank you very much, Simon. Um, uh, I, I really appreciate you giving me the opportunity to do the, these lectures. I, I really uh, enjoy um, lecturing for the, the British Institute. Let's let's get right into um, this talk. The, the title of the talk is The Art of Goldsmithing, The Secret of the Early Renaissance, with a, a, um, a question mark. But, um, I've divided the talk into five sections, and this is the way I'll be progressing. The first is just an introduction of the proposal, of the goldsmithing proposal. Uh, it's a tentative theory for the beginning of the Renaissance. I'm going to be dropping a really big theory on all, on all of you tonight, and I, I'm, I would love to hear your, um, your uh, uh, feedback. The second section is a brief historical background of goldsmithing and its importance in maintaining the practical artistic skills through the centuries, and we'll be going through a very quick history. Third section is the art of oraficeria, the goldsmith's training. What do you need to know? What did you need to know to become a goldsmith? And then the last two sections, when I really be trying to convince you of this theory, is uh, the fourth section is Lorenzo Gabetti, goldsmith. Was he the beginning of the Renaissance? And then the last one, primary literary sources and the importance of goldsmithing in the early Renaissance, written by Benvenuto Cellini and Vasari. So this was something that was known back even then. Now, what's the purpose of the talk? There's, there's three basic purposes. The first is to is explore the practical artistic beginnings of the early Renaissance, not the theoretical, even though I'm proposing a theory, but the practical, in the hand, so to speak. The second is to propose an unusual theory, in certain cases, of the roots of the manual artistic ability associated, associated with Renaissance artists. So yeah, I'm getting into a little theory, but it's about, about the manual uh, practice. And then finally, is to shed light on an often overlooked and ironically important aspect of the training of some of the most important Renaissance painters and sculptors that we know of. And those are the, the, what I'm going to be trying to sort of uh, uh, concentrate on. Now, section one, the historical background of the Renaissance. And I'll try to give you a brief uh, sort of a summary of the Renaissance in 30 seconds. The reasons of the Renaissance, so to speak. I personally go to Jakob Burkhardt. His book on the, the civilization of the Renaissance in Italy, written in the 1800s, is really, for me, the bedrock, it's still studied today, of, of why the Renaissance happened in Italy. And what does he say? He basically uh, concentrates on the independent spirit of the individual in Italy, okay, the individual man, the man is the measure of all things, like Michelangelo and David. He then uh, sort of goes into the interaction between cultures, trade, beliefs, ideas, the rediscovery of Greek and Roman texts, like Petrarch, when he rediscovered Cicero, this humanist spirit, technological innovations, Gutenberg, okay, the printed books, okay, and then the artistic innovation in return to the naturalism of Greek and Roman art. Some people even say it was the invention of the fork or the yoke and the for more food and stuff like that. But in essence, this was the Renaissance, this rebirth in certain cases, which is fine and good. Now, the theories and reality of Renaissance art, the theories are important. But since I look at Renaissance art through the hands of the artisans and through the hands of the painters and sculptors, what was the manual reality of the Renaissance? How was the Renaissance mentality, in other words, this rebirth of creativity, how was it realized in the material world and by who? Who kept it alive? Who were, or what was the true artistic bridge from the, the knowledge of the practical artistic techniques of the ancient world to the Renaissance? And this is the question. Now, when you look at the manual skill, how did it survive? If you look at the Riachi bronzes, okay, that they found in 1972 in Calabria, dug up the two of the finest specimens ever of, of Greek bronzes. 
And then you have this, you know, Greek and Roman tradition that it dips in the Middle Ages, so to speak, when sculpture goes flat and, and iconic in certain cases, and I'll get into that in a second. And then it re gets revived again in the Renaissance with someone like David. But who kept, um, who kept this skill alive? How did it get from the Riachi bronzes to Dave, to the David? Now, we could say it was a humanist philosopher, Petrarch, which is a theory, or sculptors like Nicola Pisano at left with his Hercules figure on the on the of the, of the pulpit in Pisa, 1265, or Giotto, the Onisanti Madonna from 13 early 1300s, a painter. Or we could say it's Brunelleschi with his Ospedale degli Innocenti, which is the first true Renaissance building, or the Duomo. But I want to sort of avoid that and go in a different direction and ask these questions. Were the basic practical artistic skills found in Renaissance art maintained through the centuries by goldsmiths, not by architects or sculptors or painters? And then the other question is, did the Renaissance or the rebirth of the manual skill of art begin with goldsmiths? And this is what I'd like to propose. Now, the, the case study that I'm going to be using, I'll be referring to later on, is our, our Gerberti's bronze doors, okay, that it begins in 1401, finishes in the early 1420s. And we look at these, and certain art historians say that these are, this is the first true Renaissance work. This is the beginning of the Renaissance, you know, as a Renaissance sculpture type of thing, these doors. But what I want to delve into is the tradition that got Gerberti to do those doors, and how this is actually a masterwork of goldsmith. Yes, it's a Renaissance masterpiece, but it's a masterpiece of Renaissance goldsmithing that opened the doors to, in certain cases, the rest of the Renaissance. And this is what I'm going to be trying to explain. Now, section two, the brief historical background, the goldsmith. And I love these uh, old uh, uh, sort of uh, uh, woodblock prints. Uh, this is the goldsmith student. I don't know if you can see it. There's two goldsmiths sitting down. They have their table. All their wares is a, a guy at right. He's actually in the forge, OK? Um, there's a, an apprentice that left who's pulling, probably pulling the chains with all the tools. This is what a goldsmith shop was then. This is what a goldsmith is today. And these are friends of mine. This is Alberto in the back and Lorenzo. These are two goldsmiths. And I hang around with goldsmiths. I know what they're like. I had to work with them. And what I, what I found is that this woodcut is very similar to the way these guys are still sitting today, sort of hunched over. Okay. It's a skill. It's, um, it's a tradition. That's centuries old. And if you go into the little shops in the Casa del Lorofo, right by uh, Ponte Vecchio, you're going to see all these goldsmiths still at work, okay, in this tradition that's been going on for centuries. And I even asked these guys, do you think the Renaissance started with you guys? And they said, oh, well, of course it did. Okay, and I'll get into that <laughs> in a second. But if you go back to a, a, a brief historical background of, of goldsmithing, and if we start with the Etruscans and we see these ear studs and earrings, that are from 500 BC in certain cases, uh, these globular clusters of filigree. And even my friends who are, are goldsmiths don't really know how they did this with the technology that they had in 500 BC with all these little drips of gold and stuff like that. But if you look at it, you're looking at something that's, that's 500 years before Christ. It has concept, design, execution, manual dexterity, even the concept of use of, of, of casting and gold, of precious materials. So it starts probably even before the Etruscans. This tradition gets transferred to Roman goldsmithing. We're talking about the first century BC, obviously. And you have cameos, functional jewelry, fibula, um, amulets, talismans. The Roman jewelry had sort of different cultures, Egyptian, uh, kind of Celtic. There are precious stones, gold, silver, and talios. And if you look at the bracelets, okay, those that were actually found in Pompeii, um, the, their clarity of design, style, use of materials, extreme manual skill that you find in these extremely small and precious objects. Now, if we go from the microcosm to the macrocosm, you look at ancient sculpture, you see the same sort of concept of being well made. You look at the Riachi bronzes, okay, you look the, at the Avingahori from the Republican era. And then you go to the Marcus Aurelius, okay, the, the sculpture uh, with this gilded bronze, which is actually uh, in Rome. You see the same concept of the manual dexterity, the concept of being well made. And this is something that permeates all of the arts, especially in the ancient world. Now, what we're seeing is, is a high degree of sculptural sophistication, okay, in the technical ability 
all of these artists. In fact, they weren't really even called artists in certain cases. They were called technites, technicians. And for them, being called a technites was not sort of, how could you say it, um, a derogatory, because it was a concept of being well-made. This was you were, you were supposed to be doing things and making them well-made, like the Riachi bronzes. It's a brilliant head with the beard that's all um, uh, made okay, uh, with the hair, the, the silver, the ivory eyes, okay, the, the bronze uh, lips. So this sophistication with the fall of Rome and the rise of Christianity, this starts to dissipate. And with the Byzantine and Christian mistrust of naturalistic monumental sculpture, sculpture gets relegated to reliefs, non-naturalistic, like the one that writes, that shows actually the hippodrome. In fact, if you go to the letters of Paul and the various letters to various um, um, cities, Paul gets kicked out of this one city because he begins to preach of, of this one God and how you shouldn't make effigies. And the sculptors kick him out of the city because they said, if we keep on talking like that, we're going to be out of work. And eventually they all were. So in the Byzantine and Christian era, sculpture, the large sculpture and the, the concept being well-made, actually almost dissipate, disappears. But what, where does it go to? Where does it transition into? The art of goldsmithing. The technical ability of sculpting in bronze or even in marble, if you want to say, remains in the form of relief sculpture and in the goldsmith arts. Now, I put this up of Justinian and Theodora, a Byzantine jewelry. Now, I wish I could spend more time on these things, but if you look at Justinian and his great wife, Theodora, she was a, she was a great character. If you look at what they have on, they have earrings, they have crowns, they have chalices, they have brooches, um, they have a fibula. Um, all of this attests to the value placed on the art of the goldsmith in the sense that with manual dexterity, they're decked out completely and they're also associated with nobility. This is in Ravenna, these magnificent mosaics in San Vitale in, in Ravenna. What, the, what this is associated, however, in this time period, even more so, and this is one of the, the, the most important points that I'm going to try to get to, is that with goldsmithing, which is so now important, they become even more important because of holy relics. I wish I could spend an entire lecture on holy relics because it's just too much fun. We have the head of St. John the Baptist at that left. There's three of them hanging around. Okay, that's just one of them. In the center, there are the uh, uh, thorns of the holy crown that's in uh, uh, Notre Dame. And then we have the holy grail. Uh, right, obviously that's not the Holy Grail. That's the cup that was used in the third Indiana Jones film. This is my tribute to Sean Connery, obviously. But in the concept, um, this is all, uh, uh, the concept of holy relics were important for the goldsmiths. Why? These relics in the time period were extremely important. The piece of a holy person, the object associated with the person of the place. These relics were bought, sold, stolen, even forged. The difficulty uh, was if they are authentic or not, but that didn't matter. They had to be adorned. They had to be um, sort of, uh, uh, um, uh, you had to dedicate okay, your time and effort to, to make these holy objects presentable. So what happens is the goldsmith art takes these reliquaries, and especially in Italian tradition, it's tied to the most expensive, expensive object commissioned by the guilds. So reliquaries, also altarpieces, liturgical items, chalices, crosses, but the reliquaries were the most important. Who were allowed to do these amazing works of art for these relics, which were considered extremely important? They based churches on them, goldsmiths. Now, in this tradition, the sculpture, the high quality of sculpture and sophistication of the Greeks and the Romans, you could say, maintained, it gets maintained by goldsmithing. Um, the forms, the common forms, the figural forms uh, on the reliquaries were basically done by goldsmiths. They, in certain cases, revived, they maintained this technites tradition from ancient Greece and Rome because they were proficient in use of materials, the concept of making something well, the clarity of the concept, of the design, the manipulation of materials. So the relics brought out the best in the goldsmith, um, this tradition that had been around for centuries. Now, from the Byzantine to the Carolingian and Lombard areas, okay, in other words, the end of Rome, rise of Constantinople, then Charlemagne, uh, who actually transferred thousands of, of relics into Italy, um, they accumulated all these art treasures and antiques, um, and the goldsmiths were, were at work 
trying to embellish these with some of the finest workmanship that we have ever seen. And this is just the bust of Charlemagne I'm going to get to in just a second. Now, what are some examples? Up in Germany, the Marienskrein in Aachen, the Aachen Cathedral, 1220, which is a sort of a traditional period between Romanesque and Gothic. This particular relic, uh, reliquary holds the swaddling clothes of Jesus, the loincloth, the dress of Mary, the decapitation cloth of John the Baptist. But if you look at it closely, not only is it tremendously impressive for the gold, but if you look at the workmanship of 1220, with the seated figures, drapery, heads, hands, architecture, the setting of the stones, this is a universe of manual skill. Plus, they're working with extremely precious uh, uh, materials. And it's the goldsmiths that were trusted with this extremely important, not only devotional, but also manual and practical and economic uh, on sort of a, um, a charge, brief. Now, medieval relics, as an example, Louis IX of 1239 spends 135,000 livres for the crown of thorns, the reliquary. He only spent 40,000 for all Saint Chapelle, Notre Dame. So he spent three times the amount just on the reliquary. And if you look at this with all the figures, and that's the importance of some of these things. If you look at the reliquary bust of Charlemagne from 1350, now this is 1350, and you look at this, it has some of the remains of Charlemagne, actually. Okay, this, this portrait bust with this beard, golden beard, with a silver sort of um, uh, face, and the the, um, the the fleur de lis, absolutely brilliant sort of um, uh, sort of a representation of, of skill and also even of sculpting. But it's a reliquary. It's not it's not a bust, uh, sort of like a, a of someone uh, you know that they uh, commission. Now, if we bring it into Italy. And this is just a very brief sort of overview. The Palladora di Venezia. If anyone ever you had the opportunity to go behind it, if you look at this thing, it's absolutely breathtaking. Uh, 400 years of adorning of, uh, of gems and everything. Now, this doesn't have a lot of figural stuff, it's more, more uh, two dimensional, but this attests to the tradition here in Italy. Also, the Venice and all Byzantine tradition okay, as well. So, what could we conclude? What could we conclude from this brief historical? sort of uh, background, that the most extensive, the most expensive works in the Middle Ages were tied to reliquaries. The works were entrusted to the most advanced and complete artisans, which were goldsmiths. Now, the goldsmiths were trusted to produce the design and execute it to the highest standards imaginable. They were entrusted with, um, uh, with all these extremely important materials. In fact, when I go get coffee with, with some of my goldsmiths friends. They usually have upwards of five, you know, 10,000 euros of gems and, 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 uh, and rubies in their pockets as they're going to the, to the gem setters. Okay. That's how they're, um, that's how they're used to using this. Now, what's the a possible explanation of the importance of goldsmiths to the Renaissance? Remember the technical ability of the Greeks that we see in something like the face of the Riachi bronzes. Okay. These bronzes. Okay. The expression of well-made, okay, that was the highest compliment. The uh, um, uh, reliquary bust of Charlemagne from 1350 maintains that high quality. In fact, it's, they're almost very similar. The high standard of execution throughout the centuries. It was the goldsmiths that kept this concept of the technicates, of the being well-made, even in the darkest of the Middle Ages in certain cases. And it becomes and it flourishes again in the Renaissance, thanks to them. So we have to ask, did the Renaissance or the new Marple Five of the early Renaissance begin with the goldsmiths? And there's a little image of this goldsmith uh, 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 sort of in the flames um, soldering some things onto a chalice. What was the importance of the goldsmith? Can we give him the importance that, that I think they actually do have? Um, and I think we get a better idea if we look at their training. Now, goldsmithing, oda ficeria, goldsmith, odafo, okay, from uh, gold, usually was a dealer in articles made of gold or silver, precious materials in general. And usually jewelers and goldsmiths that were sort of intertwined in certain cases. It's an artisan who makes objects in gold and other precious materials. So that it's manual sort of uh, of experience with uh, these materials. Um, the material Materials in the artistry is closely linked, and I think this is one of the most salient points that I want to give, that since they were working with extremely expensive, rare, and unusual material, the more deserving of fine craftsmanship and distinguished design, manual dexterity, 
So if you're working with pearls, diamonds, gems, um, gold, silver, you're probably not on the same sort of level as a as a mason who or a sculptor is working with um, travertine or, or or pietra serena. It's not it's not the same. So these guys had to be extremely precise, sort of like the surgeons, uh, so to speak, on the day. Very 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 good, good hands in these cases. So what did they have to deal with? What did they work with? Gold, which was coming into Italy from northern eastern Africa, Egypt, okay, Hungary from the 1320s, and the gold of Florence, obviously. Silver, okay, obviously gold is superior, but silver was easier to obtain. It was imported through large, with, uh, from large quantities, and large quantities from Germany and Central Europe. So they're working with gold and silver, just to name a few of the precious materials. Now, in order to use these things, they had to be trained. And this training really can be seen even up to today. Now, again, we'll go back to the, the artisans, uh, the, 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 the jeweler's workshop, the goldsmith's workshop. Okay, and these people, these uh, artisans are working over their tables okay, and, and forging. And if you look at a, a or go into a goldsmith's um, a shop today, you're going to see the same tools. When I took this image of these photographs at lower right, you can see the same tools that are on the wall in the background of, of the shop and this woodcut from the 15, from the 1500s. It really hasn't changed. Okay, the position hasn't changed. Even the tools haven't changed uh, that much. Now, training. And this, I think, also leads us into why it was so important to the Renaissance. The workshops, the goldsmith workshops, um, you learned in a relatively clean environment. In other words, these were high class environments. People sent their children, their sons to learn because they knew it was going to be a very high class environment, very clean in certain cases. What did you go to learn? You went there to learn drawing, design, uh, you became manually uh, 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 dexterous or uh, digital delicacy, so to speak, um, uh, decorative invention. Many tried to do it. Many were called, but few were chosen. And the vocation was for the most skilled. And this is going to be a point when I'm going to get to later on. So many tried, but many failed also at, at becoming goldsmith. What were the techniques that they had to learn? And this is to give us the background of to try and give you like the universal sort of um, aspect of their training. Drawing was extremely important. Mounting precious stones, niello and enameling, which I'll explain in just a second. Working in wax in order to do small wax sculptures. Raising, hammering, casting, bronze, gold, silver. Working on figures in relief and fire gilding. And I'll get into that in a second, just how dangerous that actually was. Now, drawing, the first. This is a drawing actually by Gibert from the early 1400s, um, uh, these figures of these uh, uh, sort of whipping individuals that were actually done for the two side figures on one of the um, quadrifoils on the, uh, uh, on the bronze doors. So even early on in the 1400s, okay, the goldsmiths, and probably early on, were drawing probably more than the painters and sculptors themselves for what they had to do. And they were drawing extremely precise. In fact, if you notice that, that it gets transferred almost precisely into uh, uh, into, into the sculpture. So, so drawing was the basis of all the art, but specifically for the goldsmith. Niello, which comes from the Latin nigellum, which is a diminutive of Niger, is black, is a fusion of sulfur, copper, silver, and lead. Uh, uh, basically, you take a piece of metal, you incise it with a burn, and then you pour this molten yellow into the grooves, and it creates like this chiaroscuro type of uh, um, effect, like you see at right, okay? Enameling from the German smelzen, which means to melt, is a material made from fusing powdered glass. As the powder melts, it gets poured into a metal surface. It hardens to smooth and vitreous sort of coating, and then it gets colored with all these different uh, materials. So this was metallurgical. This was also chemical in certain cases. And then we have raising and casting. In other words, this highly skilled process of hammering up metal with various tools until the vessel is achieved. Where I have my studio, there's actually um, someone who actually worked in this uh, in this um, uh, uh, technique, who okay, was actually one of the most famous ones in, in Florence. And then we have casting, and and I want to uh, just uh, uh, briefly sort of go into this. The casting was most important because this, the reliquaries were often cast in these various materials. Obviously, to cast anything, you have to do a, a positive, then you have to do a negative mold, you have to do a positive in wax, you encase it in plaster, soft clay, you have these tubes. Okay, you heat it up, the wax melts out, and then you pour in the molten bronze or whatever. You then let it cool. 
you break away all this external covering, and then you begin to okay, chase it. Okay, and this is this is Verrocchio's Christ and Saint Thomas, and that right is just an idea of the of the, the manual skill, okay, that the, the technical skill that's uh, um, that's necessary to do this. And then we have fire gilding, and and I I, I think many people have seen this, like down below, you, at, at right you can see this um, gilded uh, Ghiberti Annunciation. And, and this is really interesting because if you look at the doors of the of the, of the baptistry and you see all the fire gilding when there was the um the gilded bronze, how did you do this? Basically, you have to heat gold and mercury together. You have to take gold and bang it in the plates, uh, uh, start heating up your mercury. You throw in these gold plates about a ratio eight to one. The mixture is stirred. The gold basically melts. It gets this, like this golden sort of goo. You squeeze it through a leather chamois. And that takes away a bit of the, the, the mercury. You then take this buttery mass, like it looks exactly like butter, and you begin to spread it over your object, usually bronze doors, okay, that's chased a little bit. And actually use a little bit of quicksilver water, okay, to, to help it stick, okay. You then reheat the whole, the whole object. The mercury evaporates and the gold remains giving it this dull yellow color, and then it gets polished up. Now, you're dealing with evaporated mercury, which is extremely toxic. Those fumes go right to the brain. And from what I've heard from various um, physicians, that that can cause some major neurological damage if, you, if you're not careful. So these goldsmiths, not only do they know the technical, the chemical, but they are dealing with these crazy techniques that today no one does anymore because they're just too darn dangerous. And if you look at fire gilding, it's some of the most spectacular of all Renaissance art, okay, especially on these doors. This is what they were doing all the time, these gilded silver and gilded bronze uh, at right. So what, what, what could we do to try to pull all this together? Okay, how do we, how do we insert these goldsmiths in this, in this, 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 um, how can I say this, um, uh, uh, reconstruction? In the Renaissance, when you had the rise of guilds and churches, you know, the Franciscans, the Dominicans, and this need of large-scale works, basically uh, uh, dedicated to religious devotion, the expression of new wealth in certain cases, the very beginning, like the doors of the baptistry, the only capable masters of executing something like this were goldsmiths. They were proficient in sculpture and in the materials. They were well-trained. And it was only logical that goldsmiths were called to execute the most important works. So we have this rebirth, this sort of they get called on because they're the ones that kept in, in their own tradition this creative sort of um, uh, combination of, of sculpture and technical proficiency, which has been lost in certain cases in the other arts. Now, some examples very quickly. Um, the silver altar of San Giovanni, the baptistry in Florence, begun in 1367 as a docile for the altar of the baptistry designed by Leonardo di San Giovanni for the Arte di Calimala, 400 kilos of silver, gilding and smalt, okay, you had various artists throughout the, the 1400s, even they even think that Leonardo da Vinci actually worked on this thing. But if you look at this work, if you look at this work close up, I don't know if you ever had the opportunity to go up and look at it, sometimes people just sort of pass by it and say, oh, it's a little bit too busy, um, I want to look at something else like the Mary Magdalene. But if you look closely at this, you see architecture, you see the figures, you see the casting, you see the sculpting in, in three dimension in, in relief. And this is a masterwork of, of goldsmith. I mean, the whole sort of all of the Renaissance is captured within this. This is just one altarpiece in silver in the Alto del Duomo. This concentrated, highly concentrated skill in this one work. Which brings us to um, Lorenzo Gabetti. Okay, we know what the tradition is. We know what was happening before that. But we have to deal with this guy, Lorenzo Ghiberti. Did the early Renaissance begin with a goldsmith, Did with Lorenzo Ghiberti? Now, Ghiberti, don't want to spend too much time on him. His real name is Lorenzo di Cione di Ser Buonacorso. He was born in 1378, dies in 1455. Um, he receives his training in his stepfather's workshop. His stepfather was Bartolo di Michele, which was the, sort of a um, legal sort of a, a husband of his mother and grew up in a goldsmith's workshop. So he grew up in the environment of working and crafting in metals, uh, uh, of chasing, of, of working in, in, um, in wax. And if you look at his entire life work, it really reveals the hand of a trained goldsmith. Delicate, delicacy of execution, 
perfection of casting and neatness of chasing, he's the true technique. He's the true sort of embodiment of the, of the technique tradition of the Greeks and Romans, something that had been sort of lost for other centuries. Now, when you get to something like the Baptistry Door Competition, this is a quick review, 1401, the Atta di Kalimala, they called the competition for the second set of bronze doors. Remember, the first set was done by Jack Pisano. Enormously expensive undertaking for the Baptistry, the, mo the most important building in, in Florence. In competition, obviously, with the Atta di Lalana, okay, and to demonstrate the civic solidarity in the face of the threat of the Milanese, okay, that suddenly sort of leave the city, okay, as they were threatening the city. And if you look at the contestants for these doors, instead of, you know, the, the gateways of the Renaissance, Jacob de la Quercia, Felipe Brunelleschi, Gaberti, Niccolò Aratino, Francesca de Valdombrina, Simone del Colle, Donatello, there's at least three of them who were goldsmiths. The other ones I have to actually check. I didn't get too much information on them. But there's at least three that are goldsmiths. And why? Now, we all know the story that they had to do the sacrifice of Isaac as the test piece. And the finalists were Brunelleschi at left and Ghiberti at right. And they had to illustrate Isaac and Abram who has to sacrifice the son to get saved at the last minute. It's sort of a, um, sort of a, 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 a showing, you know, Florence being saved by the Milanese. And if you look at Brunelleschi's relief, and I often do this with, with my students, we go to the Bargello and I say, which one do you like the best? And they say, well, Brunelleschi is actually very dramatic. It's very powerful, which it really is. And I say, well, you know that this is a flat bronze sheet with individually cast solid figures soldered to the surface. And they say, so what? It's still really good. It's beautiful. It's powerful. You know, the angel that stops Abram Pan right as he's about to slit the throat of his son. And then you look at Ghiberti's relief. And some students say, well, it's very elegant, but it doesn't have the power. But the commission, even though Brunelleschi in his biography says it was a tie and he refuses to collaborate with Ghiberti, he says he leaves the whole commission to Ghiberti and says, I don't want to do this anymore. But the commission actually selected Ghiberti's relief. If you go to the art historical texts, the lyric, they, they quote the lyrical quality of Ghiberti's figure, the advanced visual language, they wax eloquent classicism, harmony, naturalism, proportion, decorative sensitivity, elegance. But if you get down to the nitty gritty, why did he win? Why did Ghiberti win one of the most important commissions of the early Renaissance? If you look at it, okay, sorry about the, the, the quality of the, of the image, okay, you have this very elegant figure. You say, well, you know, what's, what's the difference? in certain cases. The difference is this. The difference is the ability of Ghiberti as a goldsmith. They quoted these doors were forged by pure breath. Breath is very inexpensive. Now, the figures on Ghiberti's relief are not solid. They're hollow. In Brunelleschi's, they are solid. Which means that Ghiberti's had less bronze. It's two-thirds as heavy as Brunelleschi's relief. Plus, there's less soldering. Whenever you have to solder anything, and this is true in any sort of sculpture, whenever you have to attach pieces, it means that you need, it's going to be heavier and it's also more complex. Now, in Brunelleschi's, he soldered all the pieces together, which meant that there was a lot of bronze, a lot of material. In Ghiberti's, the only figure that soldered on is Isaac, okay, and he's hollow. So, in essence, there was less bronze, which means that it was more economical. Now, for the practically minded members of the Arte di Kalimala, this was a definite factor in choosing Ghiberti. Now, some people make, like to make the, the thing of the, the, the joke of the Fiorentino with the Braccini Corti, and say, no, there's, they can't reach into the back pocket and pull off the wallet. But if you look at this, one of the really important factors was that Ghiberti, as a brilliant goldsmith, knew how not only to create something beautiful, but he knew how to do something that was economical, because he knew how to cast something economically, in other words, without soldering. Now, that's just one of these concepts. But it comes down to the fact that it is, okay, his skill as a goldsmith. Now, it is true that if we look at Isaac, okay, the figure, it's this truly Renaissance figure, the Contraposto, but also, uh, coupled with this, it must have been great. You have a little bit of the Renaissance, but also this heavy sort of economical, like you said, um, uh, uh, saving, okay, in Ghiberti's release. Ghiberti gets the commission. 
He does 20, uh, 28 cluster foils in these square panels, works on it for 21 years, models in wax, casts in bronze, he chases, he fire gilds, he polishes, meticulous, okay, um, uh, uh, exquisite sort of finishing. But the most important thing is that for the next 20 years, he trains the first generation of great of the great early Renaissance sculptors. So who trains the first great Renaissance, early Renaissance generation of goldsmiths? And he leaves that tradition, okay, to all these individuals in certain cases. Now, if if you're not certain that this is going to flow, okay, the theory is going to flow. And again, this is just a theory that I'm proposing. Let's go to primary resources from this time period, okay? The literary sources and the importance of goldsmithing in the early Renaissance. And we have to go to Benvenuto Cellini. So Cellini at right, if you ever crossed over the, the Ponte Vecchio, Okay, there's his bust. In fact, some of my friends actually just laid a wreath to uh, down below him last week. I think it's the anniversary of his death or birth. I'm not sure. He writes a treatise in the 1500s um, in which he tries to propose the exact same thing I'm proposing to you tonight. And if you look at Cellini, um, some of his work, like the salt cellar at left, which is absolutely exquisite. Okay, it's a small little thing. It's the whole salt. Okay, but it's absolutely brilliant with all these precious materials. And then you look at the Perseus, which is a brilliant work of bronze casting, okay? One of the most brilliant works, okay? Uh, iconic works of, of the Piazza della Signoria, okay? Uh, it's from this guy who could do small and can do large, whether you like him or not. But what does he say? Let's get right, right to this. And let me just, we'll be finishing up with sort of reading from these things. This, this, is, what he, this is what Cellini says. What first prompted me to write was the knowledge of how fond people are of hearing anything new, which is what I'm actually sort of doing tonight as well. Then in the second place, and this perhaps had greater weight still, I felt much troubled in mind because of all sorts of annoying things of which I propose in the following treatise with due modesty to account, that they will move my readers to great pity and no little anger on my behalf, I am quite positive. So he's proposing this. And then he begins. Well, then, I mind me to begin with of our city of Florence and how we there were the first to revive all those arts that are the sisters of this art of mine, of how the earliest light dawned in the time of the first magnificent Cosmo de' Medici, and of that wondrous Lorenzo Ghiberti in whose time were made the beautiful gates for what was the ancient temple of Mars and is now the baptistry of our patron St. John, obviously the baptistry is referring to. I can't possibly recount all our Florentines who are adept in the great goldsmith's art. And here he begins his list. And here he tries to hammer home this point. And then we have this image of this goldsmith at the right. People di Ser Brunelesco, the first who gave new vigor to the glory of architecture, he too was a goldsmith for a long time. This is the image of, of uh, Brunelleschi uh, just by the, by the Duomo. Donatello, the greatest sculptor that ever lived, about whom I shall have plenty to say later on, stuck to the goldsmith's art right along into manhood. Andrea del Verrocchio, the sculptor, remained a goldsmith up to the time of manhood. He was the master of Loren uh, Leonardo da Vinci. And Lorenzo Gaberti, he was a goldsmith indeed. This man, who must be counted among the most admirable of goldsmiths, Applied himself to everything, but especially to casting of smaller work. We've already covered him. And then, not to be left out, also Vasari chimes in on this. And if you read through the lives of Vasari, the one thing that he touches on just enough, very diplomatically, is the art of goldsmith. And he uses it to recount his story of some of the most famous artists in the Renaissance. And we have to deal with Vasari, too. Vasari talks about Brunelleschi, and he, again, he doesn't recount, he says, oh, these were, he was a goldsmith, he was a goldsmith. He actually works it into this narrative. What does he say about Brunelleschi? Since his father observed his son to be continuously attracted to ingenious matters of art and mechanics, he then apprenticed him in the goldsmith's craft so that he might learn the art of design with a friend of his. You have to consider that goldsmith studios were like the MITs of their day. You sent them the best students to learn this craft. It was also extremely lucrative. Now, 
Luca della Robbia, with all these glazed terracotta, was sent by his father to learn the goldsmith trade from Leonardo di Ser Giovanni. Luca learned how to design and work and to work in wax, and as his confidence increased, he began to make objects in marble and bronze. And because these objects turned out very well indeed, he devoted himself so completely to sculpture, altogether abandoning the goldsmith craft. And this is what Vasari begins to insinuate that the greatest artists started as goldsmiths, but they left that art behind. And we go ahead. Botticelli, his father, raised him very consciously and had him instructed in all those things usually taught to young boys during the years before they were placed in the shops. And although the boy learned everything he wanted to quite easily, he was nevertheless restless. Disturbed by the boy's whimsical mind, his father, in desperation, placed him with a goldsmith, a friend of his name, Botticello. So it's sort of like an artistic boot camp to get Botticelli to sort of like straighten up. And then Ghirlandaio. Ghirlandaio, this is, literally gets his name from his father, who was a garland maker. In fact, his studio was right by San Lorenzo in the goldsmith area. His father apprenticed him in his own profession with a goldsmith, a craft in which he was more than an adequate master. And he executed most of the silver ex votos once kept in the Giappa, and he's in the Giappa, obviously. But he did not find that profession to his liking and did nothing but draw continuously. What can we conclude then? Sort of draw all this together. Because we see all these great artists that all started as goldsmiths. The profession of goldsmithing was highly esteemed. Fathers sent their sons to learn the craft for high social status, for gain. They didn't send them to sculptors and painters in certain cases. Those were considered the artes vulgares. In these goldsmiths' studios, Excuse me, they learned the art of design, the use of tools, digital delicacy, I've gone through the proficiency, the manual sort of mechanical, mechanical invention, um, highly specialized in the processes, casting of all of everything and you know, the tools, mathematical ability and calculation of bronze, and especially in casting. But the one conclusion that you can make, why, all, why did all these artists, why didn't they stay in the goldsmith's craft? Because goldsmithing is extremely limiting in certain cases to the creative impulses. And the creative geniuses, like a Botticelli, like a Ghirlandaio, or Luca della Robbia, left the profession and went on to work in other materials, in large sculptural pieces or in painting. It doesn't mean that they weren't capable of it, but because they couldn't express themselves. In certain cases, maybe they weren't capable, but they had the sound background in the goldsmith training that allowed them to shift into other artistic fields with no problem whatsoever. They were highly trained skilled artisan. And I always look for the artisan basis of okay, these, these masters. Now, they were transitioning into these things and having no problem. So you could actually say, well, the goldsmith training was, was available for them. And this is, this is the reason for the basis of the training of some of the greatest Renaissance artists. I want to bring this to my own personal experience, though. And this, I think, is what I always love to do. Um, I had the opportunity to do a very small silver crucifix and a very large life-size crucifix, uh, both for Australian uh, clients. Okay, one at left is a small, uh, small Christopher client in Perth, and the other one is a chapel that's in Yangebup, just outside of Perth. When I had to do the small silver, which is only 20 centimeters um, uh, uh, big, what I had to do is you have to sculpt it in wax. So you're sculpting something that's extremely small. These are about the same size as the figures in Gaberti's doors. You have to sculpt it in wax, which is extremely difficult. So you're hunched over, okay, doing all these detailed work. You're going to have to cut it into pieces and hollow it out because you're trying to save as much money as possible. The thicker the wax, the more it's going to cost you. So you make it nice and thin, okay? That means that you're going to be able to put more money in your pocket instead of paying the, the founder. Okay. You then have to take these pieces and join them together and solder them together, join all the seams, and then retouch everything with chisels and, and, uh, and, and uh, rasps. And then you have to re-sort of uh, polish it so that it looks nice and shiny. Now, the amount of work I used, I had to, to, to do okay, in order to make that look like it is was about 10 times the amount of doing a life-size crucifix with all the anatomy, and all the arms and the legs and the muscles, it was easy in considering, in comparison to this small, little, 
silver crucifix. And I remember when I when I finished both of them, when I had to do one and the other, in fact, when I was doing the, the silver crucifix, and I was amongst all these other goldsmiths who were looking at me saying, what are you doing here? You don't know what you're doing. And I was constantly asking him, how do you do this? How do you do that? And what I found is that you needed to know all the materials, all the tools, how it works in the heat, how the color. And it was mind boggling. And I was like, I'm going to stick to just being a sculptor. Because all I need to know is clay, you make it look like a figure, and then you cast it, and boom. And I, re I realized that, okay, you know, it's stressful to be a very good goldsmith. And, and this is what I found just in doing these two works. And that's why I love to, to, to bring these things together, because I think it's important to understand just the, the labor um, uh, uh, used to do these things. So what can, we, what can we conclude in all this, okay? Um, if it's not goldsmith, maybe it's the goldsmith training, which was the basis for the most important works of the early Renaissance and, the, and even those beyond. You could say that for architects like Brunelleschi, okay, or even Barocco, who put the bronze ball on top, all that knowledge you probably gained from being a goldsmith or training to be a goldsmith. For sculptors like Donatello, who was casting figures like the David, okay, which is gilded as well. How did he know how to do that? Well, he knew how to do it because he was a goldsmith, okay, and all the delicacy. For painters like Verrocchio, okay, and his digital delicacy and his painting skills, and then he sees his, his uh, 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 students sort of surpass him, but Verrocchio was a skilled sculptor, a skilled painter. He knew all the arts, okay, as well. So we really look at this, and if we try and put things into perspective, once again, the Technicates, the well-made tradition of the Greeks and the Romans. How did it get to the David, like Michelangelo? And remember, even Michelangelo, very interesting. The small model for the David, Michelangelo does in wax, jeweler's wax. It's in a Swiss bank vault. You can't get to it anymore. It's extremely interesting. So even he uses some of the techniques. But the people in the middle, the tradition in the middle between the Greeks and the Romans, the technicates, the well-made tradition, and the Renaissance were these goldsmiths in certain cases with all their manual and practical and mechanical and chemical skill. These were the guys, these were the individuals that kept these traditions alive that were allowed to flourish once again in the Renaissance. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. We're interested to hear any feedback. Well, thank you very much indeed, Alan. If you'd just like to unshare uh, your a desktop okay. so that we can have okay. the uh, audience yeah. join us in the thumbnails. <laughs> there we all are. Um, I recommend that you open up your chat uh, function as well so we can see what's going on in the chat comments so people can uh, put in comments or questions on chat. But if you want to okay. um, contribute um, live, as it were, uh, or I ask you simply to unmute yourself and say something. So the floor is open. Um, and uh, let, let's go for it. Who wants to go first? I'll take my glasses off so I don't get the glare. The glare on. Oh, hello. Whilst you, whilst you... <laughs> so, Penny, do you want to ask something? Yeah. <laughs> well, for a change, I haven't got any questions. It was a fabulous lecture and really um, brought home a lot of the things I've been learning on the courses I've been doing this week. So, thank you. Really uh, I, I, I only picked on you because you'd unmuted and I can see. <laughs> <laughs> Everyone picks on me. <laughs> okay. I, I, I'm going to ask something whilst, whilst others think, think of it. Um, I was very struck by the similarity of the pose of Michelangelo's David um, mm -hmm. and the two Calabrian Greek um, right. uh, bronzes. Uh, which I was lucky enough to see some years ago when I was down in Reggio Calabria, wow. where they are. They're, they wow. blow your mind away. They're extraordinary exactly. pieces. Um, and um, of course, they were only pulled out of the ocean relatively recently, Thank having been in the bottom sea for a very long time. So there's right. no way in the world that Michelangelo would have seen them, or indeed pretty much anyone from the time that they were made until they were found again. So uh, I'm, can, can you just comment on, on how that continuity of sculptural pose got all the way through to Michelangelo right. like that? You know, in, in, and again, I have to draw on my own personal ex experience is that obviously the Greeks and the Romans said these, the Greek sculptors that did those works um, were students of nature. In other words, they observed the human figure and the way it works mechanically. And the figure does lend itself to certain positions that's more graceful. 
um, in, in the way it, it, it works, you know, the counterbalancing of the arms, the legs, the muscles, you know, the, 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 the male figure. Um, what I think is that is that Michelangelo, since he too was that figure of nature, of the human figure, um, he sort of regained that sensitivity to the beauty of the human figure in that stance. Um, it's sort of like they they reach that same high level of um, of sensitivity that you know you know great minds think alike sometimes they may not have seen each other but they you know they they think alike in certain cases. So in fact, you see this in in many cases. In certain cases, Michelangelo did see small cameos. In fact, even the the, the knight in in San Lorenzo is taken from a small cameo from probably from a Roman cameo um, uh, of Lida and the Swan. So it may be that he did see something. Remember, he was with Lorenzo the Magnificent and and all of his ancient sort of um, uh, uh, the Farnese cup and stuff yeah. like that. So it's a, we're not sure if he actually saw something. This is David. I actually think that um, in certain cases he was more influenced by David, uh, by Donatello or even the, 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 you know, the Donatello's work, but that same sort of sensuality, the same sort of a grace in, in the form and the position, I think that's because he had the same, he, he had the same sensitivity that the sculptor that did those works. Now the Rachi Bronson were done by two different works. One was an older artist, one was a younger artist. In fact, I, I did a whole thesis on, on, on those works. In fact, if you think about it, there were actually three figures that were pulled up. One disappeared on the beach. I don't know if you know that. <laughs> no, really? There that. Yeah, the, 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 the police report said there were three figures. When they first <laughs> they pulled, and then the third one is they don't they can't find it anymore. <laughs> anyway, that's all other story. But but um I think that what you're 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 interesting, it's interesting that you should mention that, but I think it's the concept of sensitivity that Michelangelo, student of nature, revives that student of nature concept that the Greeks had. That's, that's what I would, that's, that's my take on it, if I, if I could. Okay. So, who else wants to have a go? Um, Katie Grove has put something in the, in the chat. Oh, yeah. Um, having taken a couple of goldsmithing courses, I can attest oh, to how hard it is. The question would be, how did they control fire? As today, we would use a blowtorch. I was looking at the old drawings of Goldsmith Studios, but it was hard to tell. Controlling the heat that you use to work with metals is hard enough, even with a blowtorch. Okay, you know what? Even I, I don't know. In fact, remember those um those uh, golden earrings that that I showed you, the Etruscan ones with those gold globulate sort of little things, those little sort of like my friends tried to actually reproduce them, and they they don't know how they did it. <laughs> and that's the thing. It's a good question. They may have used hot iron. Again, I'd have to ask a. Uh, um, a goldsmith, but that's one of the the things. Even soldering bronze, how do they solder all those bronze things? I mean, it's uh, it's absolutely um, uh, maybe they had something that we didn't know of, but that's something I've even asked my friends as well. In fact, Kate, that's uh, um, uh, uh, the controlling of the heat um, uh, uh, as well. And then I see someone else. Uh, but thanks, Kate, for the question. Um, Liz, can you draw any connections between goldsmiths and Giotto? The, um, I I don't know because I don't remember. Jolta was just a shepherd, and and he lived outside of the city. He gets brought in by Chimabue, you know, and 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 Jolto has this tie-in with you know Vicchio and, and stuff like that. I I don't know if he had any tie-in with the high culture of the of the goldsmith shops. Um, remember, he goes straight into a painter's workshop. Uh, uh, as well, it would be it would be interesting um, uh, as well. But that's uh, I'd have to I'd have to go back and see. Again, we're talking we're talking uh, you know third or late twelve hundreds. Um, uh, uh, but thanks, Liz, for that. Kathy, actually, were there serious health reasons that might have driven goldsmiths into other art forms? Oh, I'm sure of it. I'm absolutely sure of it. The from what I from what I have talked to about the the, the heating of the of the mercury, the evaporating mercury, that's one of the worst things you could possibly, possibly um, inhale. Um, uh, in, in fact, um, what I was told that in uh, Alice in Wonderland, the Mad Hatter, the Hatters were all mad because they used mercury to, to stiffen the, um, the velvet. I don't know if that's an urban legend, but it gets into your bloodstream and then, and then it goes, and so they're all nuts, okay? Because it, you know, it, it felt like heavy metals in, in your brain. 
Um, uh, and that's one of the, you know, the Mad Hatter of Alex in Wonderland. I'm not sure. It, just, it sounds good to say it. He's like, I keep on repeating it. I have to check it if it's actually yeah. true. <laughs> but I'm sure, I'm sure they said, well, you know, I'm not going to get neurological damage just to do a little yeah. figure. Let me go paint with lead paint. That's a lot, that's a lot more healthy. Um, uh, Alan, uh, Vanessa has a question. Oh, Vanessa. sure. Sure, sure. Hi, Vanessa. hi, Adam. Hey, um, hello. Hi. Um, I wondered whether, and I, if you said this, I'm sorry, I missed it, but is this an idea that you've had for a long time? Or well, is it... You know, I, in, in reading the Zari, it, it sort of dawned on me, okay? Um, and I remember this actually stemmed from, it was in, I think, 2012, that Susan Maddox Lister uh, uh, asked me to do something on Renaissance goldsmithing. She wanted to sort of go into a different direction. And I started to read the various treatises and I reread Bizarre to see what he said. And I reread, you know, Cellini had stuff. And then I realized that there was this common theme. It was sort of like, um, you know, well, they all started as goldsmiths, you know? And it's like, well, that's really odd because it's not very, it's not very glamorous. I mean, you know, it, you want something, you know, Giotto drawing on a rock being taken into Florence, that's, you know, that's glamorous. Being a goldsmith is boring, right? But then I realized when, and then I, I, I hang out with a lot of a friend of mine who actually are goldsmiths, and I realized that, you know, they're working constantly and they're highly skilled. And then it started to dawn on me that, you know what, this tradition, this little bubble of, of absolute skill is still going on today and no one really notices it. Go into yeah. a goldsmith shop where they really make this stuff. And they're working with chemicals and gold and rubies and carving wax and stuff like that. And they're working in gold brocades. In fact, even one of my friends, when I asked him, do you think this is real? I mean, do you think it started with the, you know, in the Renaissance, it started with the goldsmith? But of course it did. Okay? Because we do everything here. We just do it really small. <laughs> okay? It's really, really small. And then when I had a chance to actually do the small work in, in silver, that's when I said, whoa, okay, yeah, no, this, this, this is valid. This is really that's what valid. I want. Yeah, and, and I said, no, because I had the opportunity, like I got, I was sculpting this big, huge, you know, Christ on the cross, yeah. and it was, you know, but when I was sitting there hunched over on this little silver thing, and it was like, you know, nipping my, 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 my fingers with rasps and stuff, like I'm bleeding over the silver, it was like, you know, darn, this is, this is exponentially more difficult. And that's, I can understand why Luke, a little we said well the heck with this let me just go and do you know, you know place from so it, it was a combination of both someone who said look into goldsmithing and then when i started to get into it and then sort of having all these external things sort of pull, pulling all the strings together it said no this is just you know it just seems obvious it's a long-winded question uh, answer for a question but um uh, uh it's sort of a slow no, I, sort of realization thank you um, well, great to see you Vanessa. it's, great well, it's to nice you. to see you too <laughs> thank you <laughs> <laughs> All good. Um, Jody from Canada wants to is speculating that goldsmiths may, may have been driven to the other art forms because of the heavy demand for uh, painting and sculpture. Well, you know, it, it's it's possible, um, but even today, I mean, not, not that my friends are 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 swimming in 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 gold, so to speak, but you know, at that point in time, you're dealing with very, very uh, exclusive clients, um, uh, high, you know, very highly lucrative. And from, if you look at just some of the, the, the medieval stuff, especially, you know, Louis the, the Ninth, who's spending three times the amount for a goldsmith reliquary that he did to build off St. Chapelle, which is one of the most beautiful spaces on the planet. Um, you know, it, you could see why they are going towards, but if you weren't good enough, you know, you, you weren't gonna you weren't gonna make it so it it you know I'm I'm, I'm not sure I mean I, I I guess today you can't even use you know a comparison um, but let's put this way I can actually say that the people who were really making the money we probably don't even know um, because they were making their money in their in their workshops I mean, why do they what do they care about being famous <laughs> I, mean, you know, I mean I mean that's what I would say um, uh, uh, I'm not sure I just think in certain cases they just got lazy and they said let me just do it let's just sculpt. Um, instead of a, you know, <laughs> <It's> easier. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. I'm sure there was a demand. I'm sure there, I'm sure there was a demand. <laughs> anyway, anyway no, okay. Thanks for, well, thanks for all your your questions. They're great. It's, uh, it's a lot of fun. Do, do we have any more? Any more questions or comments? Because we we've gone past the top of the hour, but we can okay. go for another minute or two if people want to. Okay.
Okay, no, these are um, great. These are great. Just, um, they were give it a shot. To... Yeah, Barbara. Yeah, no, I agree. Artists, they were able to do almost yeah. everything. Yeah, yeah, I totally agree. That's yeah, true. that's true. Um, yeah. yeah. Thank you all for, for coming out. Okay. Actually, it's, uh, yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's great to see so many um, old friends and new faces on yeah. and uh, with, with, you know, we're, we're in, in the middle of the second wave and it's horrible, but these uh, Wednesday evening uh, virtual uh -huh. visits to Florence yeah, yeah. Hope, help to keep it going. And with, you know, the, the way it's looking come the spring and certainly next autumn, you'll be able, be able to come back to Florence again. So I hope you're all beginning to uh, get out your calendars and start dreaming of um, a spring or an autumn next year in Florence, because we, we, we'd love to see you all back here. Definitely. Um, in the meanwhile, I just want to thank Alan very much for his great talk. And, and um, we'll need to talk about uh, what, you want, what you want to do next in the new year, Alan, because um, I would be greatly value your contribution to the series. Um, and, I, and I also need to put out my regular weekly appeal that um, if you've enjoyed the talk and if you are so minded, we'd be very grateful um, for any contributions people can make. So I will put up the, um, uh, the link to our Just Giving crowdfunding site um, whatever you feel comfortable with is much appreciated and frankly quite uh, a lot needed at this rather difficult time um, as the second wave continues. Um, for those who are relatively new and aren't getting our regular propaganda, every M Monday we put out a, a newsletter called What's On, which tells you what's on um, and all the detail of what's happening and, and chances to catch up with programs you might have missed. Um, so if you would like to uh, get onto that mailing list and not on it already, or you're not receiving it for some reason, uh, please just drop us an email to uh, the director at BritishInstitute.it um, inbox, uh, which Sarah, I think is also putting up on the screen for you to, in the chat for you to see. So check in the chat for, um, for those two bits of information. Um, meanwhile, this time next week, it's um, Jeremy Boudreau, um, Florentine Neighborhood Series, going to the Cachonet Park. Lots of interesting stories from there. Um, so once again, thanks, Alan. Thank Great you. talk. Okay. Till the next time. And thanks all for joining in with us from all over the world. We got people from Israel and from Canada Fantastic. and from the West Coast, from the East Coast, Fantastic. from the UK, from Florence. All sorts of people here. Um, so hey, um, have a great night, everybody. Okay. And take Thank care. Thank you again. Thank you again. Thank you. Bye. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.